Uh, thank you, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And unfortunately, like I have to say, apologies for Niels who who got me here to present. And um, and thank you to Auckland Museum for the opportunity to present at NDF. I've never presented here before. It should be. It's it's a great conference, and uh, some of the talks yesterday were fantastic. Um, so, like I say, it was supposed to be a co. It's about co-designing uh, the Collect and Connect interactive table for Auckland Museum. Uh, it's not about co-presenting because Niels had to bow out. Um, and so, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, you're going to get more of a design and kind of vendor supplier angle on what went into making the table from my point of view and less of a museum specific angle from Niels's point of view. So I hope that's, that's entertaining um, and informative. Um, so I'll crack right into it. I mean, the, the idea was that um, Niels wanted me to show these slides as, a, as an intro to how the digital collection may have been interacted with once upon a time on horrible kiosks with um, keyboards and um, error messages coming up from time to time. It's not a great user experience. And he had a bit of a utopian dream um, to present it more like this and have this kind of experience going on, quite aspirational. And this is a photo that he took from uh, the opening night and you can see the engagement in the eyes of the people. It was a real success. Excuse the bored five-year-old at the bottom left. He's mine and he got sick of daddy working on it for <laughs> weeks and weeks. He doesn't think it's that impressive at all. <coughs> but first a bit of background about how we got there. So to Auckland Museum's credit, um, that I pulled some of these things from the notes that Niels, Niels gave me and um, they, they really went about kind of thinking about disrupting the ways they want people to engage with things. They thought they should um, kind of analyse the way they commission work and, and start projects off. Um, and part of that was to kind of expose uh, users and uh, suppliers like ourselves to a design thinking workshop before any brief was going to happen. Um, and, and the rest of the project took on a similar scope to um, how we run other projects with, with museums. But it was that design thinking workshop at the start where we got to actually engage with the potential audience that, that kind of kicked things off. And we were, um, we were lucky enough to be invited to that, um, uh, that, that workshop session was over two days. And the key points were, you know, what, what would make a digital interactive really enjoyable for nine to 12 year olds? Um, but also, you know, how can we design something that actually meets the museum, museum's objectives um, long term? And from a vendor point of view, from a supplier point of view, being involved at the stage is fantastic. Obviously being involved at an earlier stage as possible in all these projects is great because we have an understanding of what's going on. But being able to connect with a, an audience pre-brief, um, to be honest, we were a little bit skeptical about this process. Um, uh, we've done a lot of user testing, post-user testing, prototyping in the kind of work that we do, but we've never done kind of pre-workshop work with an audience, and, but it completely changed my mind on that approach because it was absolutely fantastic. Um, not only do we get to talk to our audience that we're developing content for, but we, we got greater empathy for what the museum wanted. Um, and not just from a brief point of view, or not from a structured point of view, just the incidental conversations that happened between different um, museum staff while we were there on the floor, just really gave us an insight and more empathy with what the museum wanted to do. Um, and obviously we got to meet other museum staff that wouldn't probably be as hands-on with the actual project. So here's just a few slides about the workshop. We had um, 14 9 to 12 year olds that came in. Um, we did an empathising round where we um, interviewed them, got a bit of understanding about their motivations, what kind of media they interact with, what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy. Um, and then we went away in teams with uh, suppliers and staff from the museum to develop or define um, what it is that we talked about, what would be useful for them if we were trying to display a certain type of media, what, what could we do in terms of concept to do that. And from there we got to prototype, um, paper prototype. It's quite interesting actually, uh, Kate's talk yesterday about common grounds in kindergarten, playgrounds and kindergarten craft tables. Uh, this was kind of a kindergarten craft table and we really got to paper prototype some ideas um, based on what the, the kids had told us. And even better, the next day we came back and we got to test it with the same kids. So we got some great insights into just some really raw uh, success measurements on what is going to be useful. Um, the kids are brutal, you know, they'll tell you that's crap, that's good, don't like that, and that's what you need at that stage. Just before I go on, a little bit about the digital content platform for Auckland Museum. Um, it's kind of a middleware layer that brings all the collection databases together and links them semantically, um, and there's an API that we used um, through that to develop the content on the table. And that was kind of a prerequisite of this project, was to get something on the floor in application sense that drew on the API, um, the DCP 
um, that Auckland had produced. Now, I think Adam, Adam's giving a talk later today about that and how that was used with museum collections online. And if you want to know more about the actual DCP, that's probably a better talk to go to because I can't tell you too much more. Um, so we eventually got the job, and, and this is where the speech kind of swings into my point of view more than kind of a museum's point of view. Um, but uh, so things that we took out of the brief, you're going to get an insight into what we presented back to the museum, but things we took out of the brief, the keywords, the synopsis of what we took out of the brief, we, it, it needed to be a multi-user experience. We obviously needed to use the, the DCP, like I just mentioned. It needed to have gaming elements, and this is all based on feedback from the kids of that workshop. It needed to be accessible in that it's, you, know, you walk up to it, it looks like it's friendly and you can use it. Um, we wanted to do some kind of visualisation, so we wanted to explore the data within the DCP and visualise that in a beautiful way. Um, a constant feedback from kids was you know, limited text, we don't like to read stuff, which is really hard. Um, additional considerations, um, it says additional considerations, but it might be gotchas. Um, physical interaction, so we wanted uh, an experience where people could move around um, rather than be at a kiosk um, zoned in. Potentially not content rich, so we didn't have, we you know we're using the full DCP, so there could be photos that are small, there could be no video, there could be no photos associated with a particular object, so we had to really think about that and creating a game using the content that wasn't content that was necessarily great public facing content. Um, that kind of content is getting migrated to be more public facing and with the use of the API for projects like this it's something that curators and people can think about when they're actually updating that digital content is how would that be viewed publicly. But those are things that went into coming up with a concept. So the, the, uh, the table, interactive table was designed specifically for the Taku Tamaki um, exhibition, Auckland Stories exhibition. And the eventual idea we come on, this is where I get to explain the entire idea in a couple of minutes and it's virtually impossible, but I have got a video to show you later, so that should be okay. So we came up with an idea of kind of a visually engaging data viz game, hunt and collect game. Um, one of the common things that came out of the, the workshop was um, this idea of treasure hunt is a really kind of compelling way to discover stuff. Um, so we wanted to basically show the breadth of the uh, digital collection um, by visualising an object within the collection without, so using the object visualisation to uh, run the game and run the objects in the game rather than the actual content to run the game. So we had this idea of pre representing the data as a giant ball of data um, and then that would sprinkle out around a surface and then players, because we wanted a physical aspect to it, we wanted to use physical models to navigate the surface of the table and players would go and collect various objects that they're told to collect that are hidden around the table. So they're essentially um, navigating a field of data and this uh, brief illustration shows they had like a, a radar scope on the front of their model, their player avatar, and that radar scope kind of went around, you went around the table and you tried to find hidden objects. So quite a simple concept but we tried to fit it within the vernacular of the exhibition being Auckland Stories and we tried to fit it in within the way um, uh, tie, tie that treasure hunt process back to the way that museums kind of collect and curate data. So the player becomes a curator, the curator goes around the table and if, essentially tags items under departments within the museum. Departments being entomology, history, um, what not. So how we were going to do this, um, uh, like I said, multi-touch uh, table, so it's a tabletop interactive. Um, using existing multi-user hardware. We wanted to use infrared camera tracking, uh, 3D printed and printed materials, so our models were gonna be 3D printed. We went down various ways to, um, to, to get those models done, but we thought the embracing the tech of 3D printed nature at the time and also allowing the museum who have 3D printers to easily replicate a model that we'd made if someone happened to throw it or walk away with it. Uh, Data-driven content um, and client-managed content from the DCP and a games engine development platform in Unity, which is a, a modern games development engine. Um, some of the look and feel. Um, so we wanted to make something quite abstract, but quite compelling. Um, we wanted it to be strong. We wanted to explore the depth of the table. A lot of these, um, not a lot of this has been done this side of the hemisphere, but a lot of the, the table interactives we see um, have this kind of hub and spoke um, consistent navigation metaphor and a lot of that is because that is the, the built-in platform that gets shipped with the table so people just use it. But we wanted to actually explore the depth of the table. We've got the potential for people to look down on the table and we can play with that depth um, visually in 3D so that was a big part of that. 
uh, something, we had the opportunity to create something really unique looking. At the end of the day, we had some great hardware to, to mess around with, and we had to be true to that hardware. So we wanted it so people would walk into the space and go, wow, there's a big glowing table with models on top of it. So we, we wanted to, to utilise that aspect of it. Some of the visual reference that we pitched to the museum might have scared them early on. Um, just in terms of sheer scale, colours, type, um, data visualisation, this is the kind of thing we really wanted to draw upon, using 3D objects to represent objects within the digital collection, um, and focusing points and layering and depth, um, and really getting the user to focus on different parts of the table. And luckily enough, um, after we'd done the concept, luckily enough the branding for the exhibition itself seemed to follow along those lines, using kind of quite bright colours and very kind of uh, low, poly, um, organic, low poly shapes, geometric shapes. And so everything started to tie together really nicely. Um, here's some selected frames from some of the initial design concepts. So as I mentioned, we wanted to, we wanted to basically describe an object within the database um, visually without using its content to describe it visually. So we came up with this idea of the data ball. So this is Orca Museum's digital collection. And each one of those objects in colours denotes an object in the collection. Um, and a category or a department from the museum which that gets categorised under. So this was going all quite well. We spec'd up a, a, a size of table that we thought would suit, uh, you know, two or three, four or five players being able to run around the table. And then we had this idea that, you know, we really wanted to play with depth. So this data ball sat in the table and it's a flat service, but because it's all 3D, digitally 3D, we can play with that depth. And then we had the idea for physical markers. You know, we, we like this idea of using type as a graphic image where, um, especially tying into the, uh, to the exhibition content, Auckland Stories, we, we thought if we, if we used a physical marker, then it would be a nice point of entry for people. Um, playing with depth again. So the final design culminates in a lot of things. There's an overall, and this is just some of the things, um, overall visual language, so we wanted it to be an integrated thing. It felt like it was all part of the same family. We had the 3D environment that we wanted to show off. We, we wanted, um, game design and user interface ideas, and, and there's a 3D printed model and avatar design selection. So we started off um, uh, doing map-based things. Something that came out of the workshop again was, you know, this, uh, this familiarity with maps and its Auckland story, so we wanted to use an Auckland map, but we didn't want it to be map-specific, just location, hint at location, so we developed some 3D maps of Auckland, some abstracted 3D maps, kind of low polygon styles, and this is quite important because the actual, data when it scatters and people have to find it, it actually scatters and hides itself in amongst the topography of the, um, of the map below it and the water was rippling and whatnot. So the player would see top down a map of, uh, abstract map of Auckland like this. And then obviously we talked about departments before where we helped Auckland Museum categorise things into a succinct amount of departments and the idea of the department markers were if, um, if you're having trouble finding something I would put down a marker that said history boom, and it would radiate out, a, radiate out a line, and it would show you where all the history objects were hidden for a brief two seconds, and then the user would get a hint, oh, I'll go over there to find that history. But obviously colour coding was a big part of that, and then creating objects that denoted each um, department, so we had ethnology, documentary heritage, archaeology, arts and design, geology, entomology, marine, there's only so many icosahedrons you can make. Uh, user interface, interface design, fascinating uh, insight into playing around with um, desktop, touch screen like controls, but also integrating a physical control. So we had a whole lot of player feedback control. The, um, this would appear underneath the marker, the model when you place it down. We've got a lot of com communication control, so a prompt to say let's play, game on. We've got a lot of incidental control where people bump into each other, it says kia ora, how are you going? And also a lot of congratulatory, you know, you did well. Um, and then there's our radar out the front of our marker. Um, and, and obviously at the end of it we want people to actually be exposed to the content. So once they have completed the game they get a list of the, uh, the objects they collected down the, the right hand side and they can actually go through and read about those objects. So it does actually have learning objectives. Um, and, and like I say, there was just a lot, a lot to, uh, to get through in terms of how a user plays with this stuff physically, digitally, um, how we encourage feedback and, um, and functional play. 
Uh, just a word on how we solved the tracking. So there's infrared cameras in the table facing upwards, and all the models needed to have a marker on the bottom of them. And a nice way to solve that in terms of wear and tear in, in a museum was we just got stickers printed, and we used a material that they use for car stickers. And then each marker, when it gets when it wears out, um, just be replaced with a sticker, very cheap, you know, 80 bucks to run off a thing of stickers. 3D models, so the departments. Uh, we wanted a consistent yet aesthetic with what we'd set up so far. We wanted them to be unique uh, yet similar. Um, they needed to be functional. There's a real kind of industrial design aspect. They need to be pick up and functional, move around. We wanted them sculptural as well, and quite a beautiful shape. So we actually inlaid a lot of the, the 3D map that we made into the object itself. And as I said before, we want to play around graphic as graphic as image. So there's the name of the actual department there, and there's a brief description on, description on the back of what that department means, but it's mostly a graphical um, approach. And no hierarchy, so they, they weren't that important. Um, 3D player, model, um, avatar, curator. Again, consistent, but we want it to be a board piece game-like thing, so you come up to the Monopoly board, you instantly know that, you know, that, you know I'm the top hat, whatever. Um, so it needs to be identifiable as something you can use. Again, it needs to be really functional. This is your main interaction piece. Sculptural, abstract, but understandable. It needs to be directional, because it had a torchlight in front of it, a radar, so it needed to have some kind of direction. And we wanted a humanoid, so people could identify with it. Um, so voila, you know, this is the culmination. It's, a, it's Sherlock Holmes as a chess pawn. And the, the, uh, the shape we ended up designing was this cool guy. So he looked pretty, pretty awesome, Sherlock. Um, he was so cool um, that we had to do a female one as well, because we forgot to do a female one, we only did a boys one. Um, and the Auckland Museum said, no, you need to do a female one, and she became known as Shelock. And she's, she, she's pretty cool too. And I'm just putting too many frames up because they just look cool. So these got 3D printed, and there's a kind of sales and marketing pitch there. There's Sherlock on the table with his radar. Okay, so for the, those of you that haven't seen it or find the whole talk so confusing at the moment, um, uh, I've got a quick kind of two minute video piece just to show it in, it in action. So you get the idea. It was pretty cool. Um, challenges. Many, many, many ways to fail. Um, digital printer, 3D printer, data. Um, but ultimately, um, it came together really, really well. Um, a lot of hard work. Unknown hardware. Um, we had three large 42-inch multi-touch screens shipped from Finland. Two of them turned up broken. Had to ship them back. Um, that kind of stuff. Just no R&D time, really. I mean, no, out of the box, these things say they work, but then 
uh, they work if you use um, the standard software that comes with them. We didn't. We wanted to use something quite custom. We wanted to use a games development platform. We wanted to make a custom application. Uh, expectations, success measurements. Um, uh, this is something um, that kind of Ben alluded to in his, his talk yesterday about the, the statistics and, and systems versus output and outcomes. Um, trying to keep expectations to a level where um, it, it suits everyone. I mean, we wanted to do something great. Auckland Museum wanted to do something great, and that was that was great. But whenever you do digital products, you know, there's this idea of is it intuitive? Well, it, the catch cry for this thing is as about as intuitive as something you've never seen before. Um, so really hard to, to keep that on track. Um, as was keeping the original concept on track and the original themes from the workshop that the, the kids told us that they wanted to see um, through an iteration process, we've actually made the thing a lot better than when we first launched. So the, some of the user interaction was not ideal. But uh, trying to keep true to that original workshop through those iterations, iterations and updates is really, really important. Um, interactive versus passive, uh, that's another entire talk um, that I could do, but um, we, we want to make truly interactive products. Um, sometimes there's no point in making something digital when you could just make a beautiful 360 DPI print um, and tell the same story. So I think interactive has a, such a huge role to play in learning and, 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 um, and work inside museums. Insights, again, this could be a completely different story. I'm running, running at a completely different um, talk, but some really surprising user interaction behavior. I and mean, we've been working on this stuff for years, but the, some, of the, some of the use cases of using physical and a digital thing at the same time, really, really surprising. And I think that's going to become more evident now. I've, I was sitting in the audience before watching the last talk, and I could see people using their laptops with a touch screen and the mouse is going away. There's people like typing and using. So we've got that kind of stuff coming through in the table as well. It's really interesting. Um, insights into attention span segmentation. So it's a mass generalization, but what we consistently see is adults wanting to stand back and work out how things work in their head without touching anything, but kids will just jump in and use it and work out how to use it. Um, Willingness to read, again, uh, something within everyone probably struggles with when creating digital media is uh, this propensity for people not to want to actually read instructions or read things. And um, that's an incredibly hard thing to pull off. Um, uh, I've actually got this theory that the more text you show, the more people will read it. When you try and reduce text down to a, its minimum level, people will go, oh, that's minimum text. I don't need to read it. So it's kind of that inverse thing happening. Um, from a project point of view, and so it's not necessarily from our point of view because we, we're an independent game developer company, so we make games every day, but, but gaming principles and a problem, solve, a problem solving things and, and in a museum exhibition um, environment, allowing people to fail um, is kind of a really hard subject, um, but really when you, when you allow people to solve problems and fail, they're going to get a lot more out of that experience than if they're told exactly how to use it and what, what to do. And, and they go off and they tell other people about it. So it's, you know, is the, is the outcome for the user or is the outcome for the, the, for the exhibition? Um, and how to do that in context, how to, how, to, how to bring those gaming principles back to um, the actual exhibition content and having some, some knowledge and some learning outcomes at the end of it. Again, I've touched on interactive versus passive. Um, I could do another, another talk on that. Um, success, uh, it became one of the features of the exhibition, we're really happy with that. We had great user feedback and participation, um, some really exciting things that people were doing. It did resonate, yeah, it did resonate with the younger audience that we were after, um, kids really got a, um, a, a, some frustration around, you could see kids with parents and kids were about to get it and the parent would move them on and go, no, let's go. Um, it encouraged internal dis discussions, we hope, within the museum about how to approach uh, things in an innovative way as well, which they are doing. Auckland Museum are great for that. Um, general wow factor. Um, part of the, that initial brief was to create something that people can't experience at home, which is a really hard thing to do these days with tech and design and interaction. Um, but it's definitely something you wouldn't have in your home. Um, Award-winning recognition, which is always nice. Last Friday, we won a um, Designers Institute of New Zealand Best Award for Interactive Applications. We're finalists in the Unity Awards, which is pretty big for us. Um, and we're finalists in the uh, digital section of the Australia Design Awards next month. And there's a couple more to come. Um, so that's, that's the end of my talk. Um, if you want to know anything more about this talk, then please feel free to contact me on those things or talk to me afterwards. If you want to know anything more about the actual project, it's probably best to contact Neil Spokal at Auckland Museum. 
Um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.